I do the work that I do because I care about children and families. I think it, part of it is my upbringing. Um, part of it is the fact that I have my own family and I feel part of this community. And I think by uh, working in this particular field that I'm doing my part. It's easy as an employee of ACS to forget that every day we're doing really important positive work. And I have parents tell me that if it weren't for ACS, they would never have gotten to where they are today. So we do a lot of really good work. We help a lot of people. I love my job because really, at the end of the day, helping people, doing things for different people, it's very reward, rewarding. They're not gonna be rich, <laughs> financially rich, but you're gonna be rich right here in the heart. People that you come in contact with, um, they are extraordinary people and just knowing that you can make a difference in their life makes you feel like an extraordinary person as well. I truly believe that, that any job you're in or any career that you're in, that you have, your heart has to be in it. Your heart has to be there, else you would not do it to the, to the best of your ability. And I love what I do. I'm passionate about what I do. Hi, my name is Audrey Taylor, and I'm a trainer for New York City's Children's Services. Our work takes many hands performing many tasks, yet we serve the same mission, protecting children and ensuring their well-being. Our core mission is protecting children from abuse and neglect. And we also work with partner agencies to strengthen families by providing services such as mental health or substance abuse counseling. If children must come into care, we work to find them strong foster families. If they cannot be reunited with their birth parents, we help them to find adoptive families. Our other responsibility is overseeing the city's child care and Head Start programs. These programs nurture the cognitive and social development of approximately 100,000 children while their parents are at work. To protect the children of our community, we investigate more than 55,000 reports of abuse and neglect each year. Behind each report, there's a family. You're about to meet three families who faced great difficulties and needed our help. As seen through their eyes, you'll witness the difference we made in their lives. I've always worked a lot, you know, being a single mom. My mother was like strict. The first time I ran away, I went to my grandmother's house. Every other week, she, the child would just pick herself up and gone. And I'm wondering, what is it? Because she's not talking. I met somebody that I was with before I had my daughter. I figured this is somebody I already knew. But in like seventh grade, he would make advances at me. I would just sneak through the door and leave. And I would like go and sleep on the train. Then I'll come home and bathe my skin and go to school. He raped my daughter when she was 11. And that's when all hell broke loose. My grades dropped. I hated school. I started to be disrespectful. Like, my fighting got so bad that in junior high school, they put me in a self-contained class. Initially, ACS was contacted to address some of Tanika's behavior, at which time ACS placed services in the home and had Tanika receive counseling along with Wendy. Um, it was later learned through counseling that Tanika was sexually abused. I reported it and they got him out of the house and so forth. And so, and so she was with me, she stayed with me. For the past three years, I was a victim of domestic violence severely. Like every weekend I would get abused. I would get emotionally and physically abused. I was going through this while I was pregnant with my younger son. She was in a slump. 
And then just listening to her story, um, it, it sent chills um, up my spine. One night I went out to the beach because that whole weekend we was like fighting and I was trying to give my kids a good time because of what we just been through. And when we came back, he was waiting for us to come home and he attacked me while I was trying to put my key in the lobby door. So I was scared to come outside. I was scared to take my kids to school because I was worried about what he would do to me in front of them. I didn't really have like parents to say because I was always alone by myself. I was to hang out a lot at a very young age. I was about six. At one time, my mom didn't come home for a week. I think that's why ACS was called. I think one of the neighbors actually noticed that and actually called in. They took me away and I was scared. I say about uh, six, seven foster homes, different foster homes. I mean, at one, one point, the foster mom I had, she didn't care if I went to school or not. It's important for ACS and foster care agencies to work together um, to, to make sure that we find the best home for, for our families. Michael had a lot of issues, a lot of behavior problems. I literally did not want to go to school at all. I was angry. And I said something to one kid. Kid got mad, I was about to fight him. The teacher said, no, 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 no. And I stabbed him, stabbed him in his arm. And then uh, that day, I remember the school was ready. They already had the paper signed out, ready to kick me out of school. And that was my, actually my last chance. A lot of the school staff really didn't like him, you know, because of this behavior. They only saw him as this bad kid. I was going on with the procedure of putting my victimizer in jail, and they came in to investigate to see if everything was all right with me and my kids. When I got the case, made the initial home visit with the CPS worker, mom was emotionally wrecked. As soon as she said ACS, I was scared, like, oh my God, like, what is gonna happen to me? Like, they're gonna take my kids away. And like, my heart fell to my stomach. Like, I didn't even wanna open the door. And I let her in and she let me know that it wasn't against me. It was against the one who was abusing me. So I was like, all right, that's one of the things that made me comfortable. She was in serious danger. And as a result, we were able to get her a safety transfer in a two month time frame. And she said she was ready to take back. Her life. I was a raging bull. I literally used to see red. My mom used to curse a lot. When she didn't go to school for two days on a row, I just snapped. I snapped. And so I started to, I beat her with a belt. She came home beat me and went back to work. And the next day I told her I went to school late and then she beat me again. I rode the train all night. I went to school in the morning and I told her what my mom did. And they took me to Coney Island Hospital for evaluation. ACS was called and they took her away. Tanika was placed out of the home in foster care. And a service plan was created, but the paramount thing is for us to really get to know the family because you can't put place, services in place if you really don't know what the family's needs are. The best thing that she ever did was to turn me in because then I had to take a look at me because even though we were in therapy, I still wasn't getting help for myself. I, it was all about my daughter fix my daughter and get her back to who she was. That was my focus. I had no one standing in my corner but God and Miss Mayo. And so it was a pleasure to go there because I could relax, release, and let go. I could have told Miss Mayo whatever I was thinking and not be judged. 
the foster home had some issues that wasn't meeting his needs. And so I called Mr. Fair and I asked him where, whether he would be willing to foster Michael. The social worker came to me and said, I got this kid. Because you start seeing how you did the other two kids, you turned them around. You fight for them. But this is one kid that I know you can't, but you can give it a shot. I saw the house, I was like, hey, this is nice. Never lived in a house. Most foster parents, they just take the child and just boom. And then a week later, they say, here you go. <laughs> I can't take him, I just can't tolerate him. Me, I feel him. I feel what your potential is. He sat me down, set down the rules. I was like, rules? I don't know what those are. I never had any. It turned out he wasn't as bad as he thought he was. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He thought he wanted to believe he was a really bad kid because he figures that's the only way he gonna get what he can by acting like he's bad. But I saw right through that. I, you ain't tough. That's, you ain't tough. You ain't. You were just pretending to be tough. I remember one time I got into a fight. I came home and I was like, "All right, I'm expect my bags to be packed." And he was like, "Oh, sit down." I was looking around. I was like, "Where are my bags?" He's like, "What are you talking about?" I'm not being kicked out. I was like, no. I was like, whoa, that was a shock. I said, no, this could be good for you if you want it. Me and you can play, we can joke, we have a good time. You're my son. And he actually said that. I care, you know, I love you, this and this and that. I was like, wow. When he actually said he loved me, I was like, whoa. Never heard that word before. I didn't from my parents. And I started to realize, I was like, you know what? I want to change. Can I call you dad? He's like, if that's what you want. You know what? You're my father. What's up, dad? And he looked at me, he was like, what's up, son? And then there was like a, you know, we had that little moment. We always have a little moment, like every time, whether I'm getting in trouble, it's always that one little thing that sparks off, like, hey, I love you. You know, ACS was involved all through the process because they're protecting Tanico. In my therapy sessions, I didn't just go and sit down. I spoke about how I felt. I let out my anger. I, I let out feeling hurt and all that. These days, I came home and cried. I made a decision that I was really going to change my parenting and really work at being the best parent that I could possibly be. And once we deemed that everything is safe and that the risk has been reduced, we can actually make a recommendation to the court to say, look, they are ready. She was away for almost a year and then she came back. It was just the happiest moment other than when she was born to have my daughter back again, to start the healing process. I felt safe because my mom started to um approach me and talk to me more and ask me how I felt. My mom would say, tell me something you don't like that I'm doing. So that's what basically started to um, create a, a better bond between us. It has been a long, hard, excruciated, dark journey, but it is worth it. You have to be willing to dig and feel that pain to get to that nugget. It's there. And that's what we did, both of us. I learned from all, everything that happened. I learned it's, it was it was a moral in everything, everything. They helped me making a plan, like a life plan. She went to services. She partaked in domestic violence counseling. She had the children going to DV counseling. Children start attending daycare and, and so forth. She was my main support system because I lost a lot of friends and family. Like, I really had nobody, but it was just me and my kids. So just to have somebody saying that they would be there for me, you know, it felt really good. That was my first step of my confidence coming back. So now with a, a new life, a new place to live in a totally different environment, she states she feels safe and good about herself, and she is actually pursuing a career. Everything is better. My kids are better. My oldest son is learning to trust me again. 
being that he had to watch me compromise myself to deal with it, he lost a lot of respect, a lot of trust. So we rebuilding that. Our relationship is getting a lot better. If you give them all the tools and the support and the, you know, empower them, then you, you know, you might ultimately save a whole family's life. Michael started making an honor roll every month. I want to be somebody. I want to become something great, but I didn't have anything to like, you know, push me towards that way. But when I came here, I was like, you know, he's pushing me towards, you know, all my goals. And I was like, all right, I can do this. Gave yourself to school, all right? Yeah. He was much more respectful, kinder, nicer. The, that tough exterior wasn't there anymore. We wasn't adopted home at the time. We just was a foster home. So we said, how do you become an adopted home? So they told us the steps classes you had to take and all that and stuff. We said, okay. Now I said, Michael, do you want to stay? Is this the home you would like to stay in? Michael says, yeah. He got his big gleam in his face. Said, yeah. I said, all right, Michael. That's when I hit me. This is what I wanted all this time, a family, a father figure to be there for me. That's when I realized they really did love me. They surprised me and said, by the way, he's got two sisters. I said, okay, I don't know if I want to go there, but we took the two sisters. And then after that, by the way, he's got another brother. I said, come on. Michael, Tanika, and all our children need to live in safe, caring families. But some families need another kind of help that Children's Services provides. Every weekday, thousands of children, like Michael Fair's brother, are dropped off at hundreds of child care and Head Start centers throughout New York City. Child care provides a safe, nurturing, and high-quality educational experience for children while their parents work. Head Start offers free educational programs for children ages 3 to 5 and support services for their families. Children's Services, along with our partner agencies, fulfills several essential needs of children. Child protection, foster care, Head Start and Child Care are all vitally important services that show we do make a difference. <laughs>